Hello everyone, today is Thursday, August 2nd, 2018. This is the week in charts. As usual, I want to thank everybody for coming today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously current market conditions, and that's going to dovetail into today's topics. And if you have any questions on trading, feel free to ask those. If you don't mind, keeping them what's on the slides until we get towards the end of the slides and I'll let you know when that is and then also wait until we get off the slides into the actual live markets before you begin asking about stocks and I'll let you know when that is also and then if you don't mind ask about one stock at a time that's for your benefit so I know what's being what I covered and what I didn't and then also um, I think that's it <laughs> I, I want to follow up a little bit on timing the market and one reason I was late this morning is that I came in really early this morning and started doing some hand testing. When years ago I used to program everything, and now I prefer to just do things by hand. Although I I am thinking about getting some of my programming buddies involved in some of this market timing. And this all stems from last week's presentation where I was asked about timing the market, and I'm going to recap a little bit of that this week. Before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So last week I was asked about timing the market. And just hang on, we'll just go through these really quick. And I just want to kind of recap a little bit. One thing that I did talk about last week is timing the market is tough. The market does it trend as well or as much as you think it might? Every now and then you'll get a really nice, nice bull market. And I'm going to show you how to get on the right side of that. And every now and then you get a real nice bear market because it goes down for an extended period of time. And we're also going to explore how to be on the right side of that. But in general, there are a lot of whipsaws along the way. And I'm going to flesh that out in a lot more detail. As I said last week, I like to get a feel for things versus hard and fast rules. I like looking at a lot, a lot of stocks. And right now what I'm seeing is the market's choppy. So I need to be mostly sitting on my hands. And oh, by the way, I want to show you a little trade here in just a minute, which is um, what I consider kind of money in the corner, although that sounds a little cocky, but we'll get to that in a minute or two. Now, one thing I've been toying with a lot, and I've been saying this for years and years and years, and I learned this many years ago, is that if the market is not too far away from all-time highs or new highs or one-year highs even, give it the benefit of the doubt, air on the long side. And that's what I woke up this morning to work on was the little indicator that I created last week where I was just simply measuring how far away the market was from new highs. And I went back to 1928 and hand-tested that. And I haven't gotten it all in the spreadsheet, but I did – do enough testing to learn what can uh, can come from that. And I'll explain that in one second. Now, one thing that you have to be careful with, and that this morning there was a few whipsaw signals, and I did find myself adding in a new filter. And I think that the filter is legitimate and okay, but you do have to avoid the siren call of multiple indicators, which could lead to analysis paralysis. But if you're keeping it really simple and you only have a couple of rules, and I think if you can pretty much fit it on that cocktail napkin, as I often describe, then I think it's okay. Now, as I often preach, technical analysis doesn't have to be that technical. And when we get to the charts here in one minute, the live charts, the first thing you need to ask yourself is, is the market simply higher, or lower, or about the same as it was? And when we get to the live charts, this will be updated from last week. But you can see the Russell 2000 is going sideways for a couple of months, even though longer term, it still looks like it's in a pretty good uptrend. And this is a 50-day moving average, and that's got a nice little slope to it. And you also have a lot of day of light, meaning that the lows are greater than moving average. So longer term, still looking pretty good. Short to intermediate term, though, as you can see, we're beginning to end up with a sideways blue arrow, which is okay. And normal for the summer, you just have to learn to accept that.
Now, as I often preach, you can't have a bear market without downside Dave light. And I know not everybody's here uh, has been here before. Daylight, downside Dave light simply means you got a moving average and the high is less than the moving average. We used to call it Dave light. I'm sorry, daylight, but now we start to call it Dave light. And then on the upside, conversely, just the opposite, the lows are greater than the moving average. So when the highs are less than the moving average, it's red. When the lows are greater than the moving average, it's green. Now, I wouldn't rush out and create a red light, green light system. But as you can see, and as I'm going to flesh, as I'm going to flesh out, easy for me to say, with this little simple system in just one second, these simple market timing things can help to keep you on the right side of the market. And the big thing is they can help to keep you in major, major, major bull markets and keep you out of major, major, major bear markets. And that's the most important thing. You want to make as much money as you can for as long as you can. And then you want to avoid losing a lot of money in a bear market or even better, actually shorting a little bit and making some money in a bear market. And as I said last week, when you zoom this in, you can see that the S&P did come down and kiss the moving average and then begin to take off again. If I can get my pen to work, you see. And then when this this is just a count, this is the number of bars of daylight. It's up about 90 something here. And usually when you get close to 100 or so, it begins. The market begins to correct. I wouldn't time the market just off of that. But I would just say, well, it's way up here. It's getting a little frothy. Embrace for it. Maybe just honor your stops, which you should do anyway, and be super duper selective on new positions. Now, I'm kind of rushing through a few of these things just to kind of build the base back up. But if you go in and watch last week's presentation, you'll be up to speed on this. And, of course, you could always draw your big blue arrow if you don't know which way the market is headed. So again, you want to err on the side of the longer term trend. And last week, this is what I introduced. I just came up with a little indicator here. And all this does is this is a percentage uh, off of the 250 day high. I use 250 days because that's roughly one year's worth of trading. So obviously, when the market is up here making all time highs, it's going to be 0% away from all-time highs because it's at it's literally at all-time highs but as we get to sell off you begin to measure how far is that sell off from those new highs and you can see this is where what I was talking about last week and I just put in five percent as a number and you can see when it gets greater than five percent on a daily chart you might want to pull in your horns a little bit and then if it drops below five percent then maybe the market is Okay, once again, like I discussed last week, as long as it's in the green, meaning that you're less than 5% away from those 250-day highs, then err on the side of the longer-term trend. Now, again, I, I'm not implying that you use this as a timing system in and of itself, but it is a little simple thing, and then I'm going to flesh it out even further using a weekly chart. But it's another little simple trick that can keep you on the right side of the market. And then I was just talking about daylight earlier. Let's just back this chart out. I'll back this yellow out, green out. You could see we had a really nice daylight trend, Dave light trend here, and then mostly upside Dave light here and here. So, again, just something really simple like the lows being greater than the moving average can help you keep you to help to keep you on the right side of the market. Now, this is what I woke up really early and worked on. And my thinking was, if the market is 10% or more away from its 50-week high, and this is a weekly chart, okay? So if the market is 10% or more away from this 50 week high, you need to be out of the market and that would be a bearish time. 
So obviously this is the depression way back in the 30s. And what's interesting here is even though it looks like you, let's say you were long from way back here, even though in the end you give up quite a bit, and that's just trend following, from here down to here is 83%. So you would have avoided an 83% slide keeping the lion's share of your money. And if you were long coming into the recession, you would have had you would have made a lot of money during this great bull run right before. Now, notice that you would have gotten some whipsaw in here. And you can see when it's green, it means that you're less than 10% away from 50-week highs. And when it's red, it means you're more than 10% away from 52, I'm sorry, 50-week highs, okay? So you will get a little whipsaw here and there. Now, one thing that I discovered this morning, and this is where you got to be careful not to add too many rules, but I said, what happens if we add in a daylight rule, or daylight rule, I should say. I'm trying to get used to saying that. So, for instance, let's say it turns green, and the market looks like this. Even though the market's improving, it still has downside Dave light, meaning that the major trend is still down. Then you might want to sit on your hands until, unless it gets back above that moving average, until you have upside Dave light. For instance, back here, it's it's sort of getting bullish right around here, but you had some downside Dave light. So wait until you begin to have some upside Dave light before getting long and then you can see he had a really good run in here so that simple little rule will help to keep you out of trouble and i don't think it's getting too complicated by adding just one little small trend filter in there and you can see the major bull and bear trends are going to happen when you're obviously less than 200 I'm sorry, less than 10% away from 50-week highs. And when you're more than 10% away from 50-week highs, you're going to have bear markets. So bull markets, less than 10% away. Bear markets, more than 10% away. And it always amazes me how something as simple as this can really help to keep you on the right side of the market. So if you look in the 50s, now you would have been long in 1950 caught a pretty good run you did have a spill here a little bit of a pullback and that did get you above that 10 percent line but notice you had a decent run here it wasn't the mother of all runs and then once again later in the 50s you had a really good run and then of course you had a bit of a sell-off and the market came back up again and then a pretty serious sell-off once again. So this was bearish. Now, the magnitude of these is are fairly big. So either being short or being out of the market completely is important. And I'm going to reiterate that in just one second. But you can see nice upside Dave light here. Okay. And this nice little uptrend here, you're less than... 10% away from those 250-week highs. I'm sorry, 50-week highs. And then again, you can see these major sell-offs throughout history. Now, there's no guarantee it's going to always get you out right before a major sell-off, but it just pretty seems like pretty much, for the most part, it will. And one thing that I learned from Greg Morris, it's just the opposite of what you think it would be Tops are more of a process, okay, and bottoms are more of an event, bam, okay? So tops are a process and bottoms are an event. And that's just the opposite of what you think it would be because everybody always focuses on the crash. Well, usually a market doesn't go up to make new highs and then crash. Usually it starts rolling over and then notice here, in this particular case, 
it was 10% away from its highs and then it began to crash a little bit. And we'll fast forward to more recent times. Look at that. So when you come into, let's say, 1987, you could see that what happened before 1987? Well, this market went up. And on a daily basis, it's, it's much more obvious. Now, this does look like a crash. But David just said it wasn't a crash. It wasn't a it's a process. Well, notice that it did get 10 percent. Away from those highs before it turned bearish. So it would actually take you out on that moving average. And that's not part of the system, but it just so happens that you would have gotten knocked out on that 10 percent slide. Now, it sucks, but notice that it stayed bullish throughout this whole run here. As I preach, in the end, trend following often ends badly. But if you got in in 1984 and you stayed long for three years, it got knocked out right before that crash. Yeah, it, your last week sucked, but not as bad as it sucked for everybody else. And then you could see you had a pretty nice bullish run after that crash. You had another little sell-off here. Okay, and then the market turned back up. Well, you don't know whether this is going to be the beginning of something bigger or not. So as I often preach, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Now, what's cool is obviously we had that great bull run in the 90s and notice what happened notice during this huge period here you were pretty close to 200 and I think this is actually supposed to be 50 but you were pretty close to 50 week highs that entire time and then we did have that sell-off in 98 I forget what caused that but that's okay. If you got knocked out in 98 and it didn't turn into a big bear market, no problem. Because look what happened afterwards. The market became bullish again and stayed in mostly bullish mode for a long, long time. When did it go bearish? Well, it went bearish in 2000 when the market went above 10%. Or I should say the indicator went above 10%, meaning the market is below 10% of its all-time average. Now, this is a, a good example here of what I wanted to show you about. It turned bullish, but the market didn't have upside day light. So what I would recommend, and again, you don't want to add too many rules to a system, but I think a simple additional trend rule would be okay. And in my hand testing, what I was doing, just FYI, was for buys, let's say the market's above 10%, you had to have two weeks below the 10% line, meaning the market is within 10% of its all-time highs. And then the other caveat, which I found for sell signals that you'd have like right here, when the market's still in a pretty serious downtrend, was that you also have to have upside daylight, day light. So that means that the trend, at least over the short to intermediate term, is headed higher, and then the market is not too far from all-time highs. So... Once again, you can see major bear market. Now, again, I've, I've used all different types of indicators for this. The Dave light in and of itself works really well. We'll take a quick look at the major bow ties in one second. That also works pretty well. So I don't want to reinvent the wheel too much, but this is a very simple indicator. My research over the last 10 to 15 years has been how simple can I make trend following and then even before that i was still writing simple systems after i went through the grail hunt of course and then you fast forward to 2008 well 2008 everybody talks about how horrible it was and nobody saw it coming well i'm not saying that i'm never gonna get whacked in a bear market again but nearly every indicator that i've ever used tells me that I should at the least pull my horns in. And you can see even this simple little 10% thing, market was down 10% right here. And then the bear market started in earnest. Now, again, you had 
a slight buy signal here, but what was going on? Well, the market was below the moving average. So this is my only trend filter. And I'm like, well, we're not going to take this buy signal here. And you stay short during this entire period. Now, one thing I want to show you is, once again, look at the bottom. Bit of a V-shaped bottom in 2009. So if you're looking at a weekly chart and you're waiting for that weekly daylight, you're going to have some lag. You're also going to have some lag because you're waiting for that market. And with this particular system, you're waiting for that market to get within 10% of its 250 I'm sorry, I keep saying 250 day, a 250 week high, okay? So this is a weekly chart, so we're looking at 50 week highs in this particular case. And of course, whipsaw does happen, but if you can capture enough trend in between the whipsaw, you'll do just fine, but it is frustrating. And then eventually you capture that major, major, major bull trend. Now, as I've been saying, market timing is tough, and I'm going to flesh out a few things in just one second just to remind you of that, beat that dead horse once again. I don't want to make it look like it's taking candy from a baby, but you can see some of these simple things can, and can being the key word in that sentence, keep you on the right side of the market. So this nice leg from 2012 higher looked pretty darn good. Now you got about 10% here, and what do you do? Well, you get out of its way. Why? Well, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. And then we're still in this bullish trend that you could argue began in 2016 after that 2015-16 correction. Make no bones about it. This was an ugly market. I thought it was the beginning of the end. Did I get crazy bearish? No, but I shorted a few things, made a little money, and got stopped out. Better than a poke in the eyes, what I say. Now, here's some random thoughts on what I did this morning and just market timing in general from prior research. And I'd hope to give you some more results on this this morning and some more gleamings, but I think that I can kind of go back to things I've discovered in the past and add into what I discovered this morning. And I think that it'll be a good start at least. So first of all, nothing's perfect. And we are trend following. In order to follow a trend, you must first have a trend to follow. Classic Greg Morris. Well, you have to wait for that trend to start. So you will be a little late to the party. And as I said earlier, it ends badly. So you will overstay your welcome and get a bit of a hangover. But if you can capture the middle, that's all you need to be successful. So what I'm saying here is, Okay, now we have a trend. Let's get in. Yay, we get in a trend, and then this happens in the end. Well, this sucks, okay? And it's not the greatest thing in the world getting in kind of late, but if you make a move from here to here and you make a lot of money, don't focus on what you gave up in the end. As I preach, focus on what you made during a trend. So... That might be something worth writing down. I think I'm not the first person to say it, so I'm not going to brag. But if you could just capture some of the middle, you're going to do just fine. Now, with market timing, I think something is better than nothing. And again, keep it simple. But what I have seen over and over and over again, and I reiterated this morning in my research, or was reaffirmed this morning in my research, is that you will, as a general statement, if the market gets really, really ugly, it turns to a really, really ugly bear market, you will often avoid the majority of it. Now, back in the 20s, when if you were looking at Dave Light or if you were looking at major bow ties, which I'll reiterate on in one second, or if you were looking at the fact that, well, when the market is 10% off its highs, maybe I want to get out of the way. You could look at any one of those very simple metrics and would have, it would have gotten you out before the market lost an additional 80% of its value. Now, again, you would have lost something in the end because you let's say you were long to the roaring 20s and then you get stopped out. So, yeah, this would have sucked 
but from here to here would not, but you avoid an 80 something percent drop. I think it was 83% from getting stopped out. Pick your favorite signal. Pick your favorite simple market timing signal. So again, keep it simple and then avoid adding too many rules. Just learn to live with whipsaw, learn to live with lag. Let me repeat that. Learn to live with some whipsaw, learn to live with some lag. If you start putting too many rules in it, then you're starting to curve fit your data back to the old data. I'm sorry. You're starting to curve fit to that hindsight bias, perfect hindsight bias, and you don't want to do that because it, it will never shape out the same in the future. And I kind of got a little ahead of myself, but the point I was trying to make is hindsight is always 2020. And I'm reading the Undoing Project, which I'll put on books to read. And it's a pretty good book. And one of the quotes of the of the two guys they're talking about uh, is based on people think they can predict better than they truly can because they look back in time and see how the prediction was obvious. And I meant to grab the quote before we got started, but the point is I make it look a lot easier than it is, but it's not as difficult as many try to make it. So something very, very simple can help to keep you on the right side of the market. And yeah, hindsight is definitely 2020, but so far over the past 150 years or so, some simple things would more than likely have, well, for a fact, in hindsight, for a fact, would have kept you out of major bear markets. And since I've been in this career, a couple of my signals, a major bow tie in 2000 and a major bow tie in 2007, by major, I mean off of all-time highs and off of weekly charts, would have kept you out of those bear markets. Now, the other thing that I thought about a lot this morning as I'm writing these dates down is in some cases it's like, okay, well, you're getting in in, let's see if I can find a good example for you. Go back to the charts, probably be even better. But, you know, let's say you're getting in like 1934 or 1933 and you go all the way to 1935, now you have two years where you're actually underwater following this. Could you really follow a system for two years? And then in 1937, another year or two later, you finally caught a really, really nice trend, which would have paid for all those prior years. So you had roughly four years worth of trading, and the first three of those, you were losing money. So that's something to kind of think about in the back of your head. And I'm not saying you definitely want to be long or definitely want to be short for three or four years while you have these signals. But at the least, you could say, well, the market looks it's like an uptrend based on these signals. So maybe I should be focusing on the long side. But again, even if you're following these major signals, you would avoid major, major bull bear markets, Freudian slip, I hope not. You would avoid major, major bear markets, and you would stay long many, many years in major, major bull markets. All right. Any questions on market timing? Yeah, sorry about the screen thing. So keep it simple, and it can, and can be the keyword in that sentence, keep you on the right side of the market. And something simple is better than nothing. That I can guarantee. Now, I want to show you something real quick here. And this is one reason I was getting, I was late getting uh, to the show today, just because I had some trades on. I was trying to finish my research, my slides, et cetera. And... Jimmy Rogers once said 
that he just waits until his money lying in the corner, and then all he does is walk over and pick it up. In the meantime, he does nothing. And that's kind of how I see the ogre trades. Now, keep in mind that I'm not suggesting they always print money because they don't, and you will have some losing trades. And this is not your bread and butter, but sometimes you could end up with a free trade or a trade that's – what's a good way of putting it? Your risk to reward is, is pretty good as long as you are very prudent. And that's – the hard part is you have to be willing to get out the way and take a small loss and take a stab at it. They don't always work. But a lot of times, everybody panics and dumps right on the open. So when you come in the market, when you come into your office and you see futures are down sharply, especially when the longer, longer, longer term uptrend remains intact, then you need to think, well, maybe I should buy this market when it shows signs of reversing from an opening gap reversal. And then you can put in a stop down here, plus a little wiggle room. And I don't know if it will show up on your screen, just in case it does that first little fake out move. And what you might also do is maybe wait for a little bit more confirmation. So it's like, okay, it looks like we got an opening gap reversal here, kind of stalled out a little bit, came back in. Maybe wait for it to continue higher a little bit before hopping on board. But these are really cool, a uh, little bit more advanced trading technique, but they're a lot of fun. Now, my problem is if I put on a day trade like this, I begin to obsess over every tick. And it's hard for me to practice all the things I preach about. Turn your screens off. Don't watch it. Because there is a little management involved. You do want to take your profits off. And remember, we're not doing this to get rich. We're just doing this to make a little money. And, I, and on the open, it was kind of cool. I went in and played this. And I had a position or two that were getting whacked pretty hard. And I'm like, well, that's a bit of a bummer. But instead of focusing on that, I came in and said, well, let's take a look at this opening gap reversal. Play the opening gap reversal. And not that this will always happen, but it kind of mitigated my losses on the open on the other position. So I ended up breaking even. And that was kind of a good thing to do. Now, a minute ago, I said, Major, let me just backtrack for a second. Are there any questions on opening gap reversals first before we go any further? And opening gap reversals, sometimes if you, let's say if you were long a stock or any other market and you come in and you get whacked overnight, like my broker many, many years told me, you already have the loss. Now just figure out a way to make it better. So ogres could also be used to exit losing positions, obviously. Now, earlier I was saying major bow ties. And I know the people that come every week, your eyes are going to glaze over. But I just want to kind of reiterate the fact that if you're just looking at major bow ties on a weekly chart, that in and of itself can help to keep you on the right side of the market. All right, I'll go through this real quick because I've been talking about it quite a bit, and it's going to take me a while to finish it anyway. Uh, I've been working on this. For those of you who are wondering what I've been up to, I've been working on this learning management system to where I'm going to parse out all these lessons and some of the courses and to more bite-sized chunks. And it's going to be very trackable. So if you're in the courses, we could track your progress and see how far along you are. And as I've said quite a bit, without being a dead horse too much, I've had people email me for years and years and years and years and I begin to think that they're mentally challenged. And finally, I tell them, just go back and read the first book. And they're like, oh, yeah, I've been meaning to get that. So this is going to remove that. You're going to have to have a little skin in the game. You're going to have to get serious. And this is one way I think I can reach more people and help more people in the process. And you'll be able to track your progress throughout and so I can look at this and say, OK, well, he's mostly through the methodology, so he should have an idea of how it works. But he's just getting started on money management. So he needs to finish that up before he's putting hard earned cash in the market. And then I had a couple little cool features that I'm adding to this, like 911 calls. Let's say you get into a trade, you begin to panic. You can earn these 911 calls by just remaining a member. And I'll give you a cell phone or something to call, and we can walk you through it. 
And then also consultation. Usually if I'd spend a half an hour with somebody, not that I'm perfect, but I could, I, I, I'm probably even better as most people are. Psychologically, it's been proven to be a fact, by the way. Much easier to see other people's problems than your own. But usually I could talk with someone just for a few minutes and then figure out what they're doing wrong. And at the least, I think I could point you back into the right direction. And then there's going to be bonuses added in. So the longer you stay a member, you're going to get more and more bonuses. So I'm supposed to launch this within a couple of weeks, but it just, just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. All right, let's take a look at the overall market. And then let's take a look at uh, you guys want to start asking about your individual stocks. Feel free to do so now. Let's take a look at the P's. OK, well, a little open gap reversal today. Bam, as you can see. And we're sitting right on top of this little breakout level right above these multiple peaks. So that's obviously a good thing. So, so far, so good. Market kind of hanging in there. And as I often say, air on the side of longer term trend. Let's just throw a 50 day moving average in there for S and G's. That's a five day moving average. Let's do a 50. And you can see we're back nicely above the 50 day moving average. And we go to a weekly chart. And we had that one little tag right here. But for the most part, we're still in this nice little uptrend. And guess what? What did I say earlier about? New highs, well, when do we make all-time highs? Back in February, I'm sorry, January, okay? So we're 2% away from all-time highs. So that silly little signal, if you're less than 5% or 10%, depends on how you want to look at it, away from new highs, then err on the side of the longer-term trend. Don't get too bearish might be a better way of putting it if we've had quite a few shorts setting up over the past several couple of months or so but i decided not to take any of them even though a few of them sold off really hard and nice i was like well you know what i'm willing to walk away and be okay because i don't want to fight that longer term trend now if we start getting these sell signals or if in general the market begins kind of rolling over and we start seeing a lot, a lot of debacle du jours, although we have seen quite a few lately, obviously Facebook, Twitter, and a few others. But if we start seeing more and more of these debacle du jours. I don't think Twitter was that bad, though, was it? Yeah, it's pretty ugly. Okay. How's that for an oxymoron from a trend following moron? But anyway, if we start seeing more and more stocks getting torpedoed, then we might have something to worry about. And let's just take a look at the spiders real quick. So in these spiders where you get the true open, you can see that opening gap reversal looks pretty interesting. Now, one thing you might do if you're playing an ogre is just keep your chart on the daily chart so you're not watching every little zig and zag on the intraday chart. Let things open for a little while, see if it begins to rally. Now, the first question people say is, Dave, should I wait? How long do I wait? Well, you can't. There's no set time to wait because what could happen is the market could reverse on an opening tick. So you have to make that decision. If it reverses in the first bar, you got to decide where you're going to get in on that trade. And in the case like this, I just kind of drew it in, eyeballed it. But if you look at a daily chart, maybe say, OK, we gap down here. I'm going to get in if it takes out this part here. Now, some people... And a lot of times it's a little too late, but some people say, well, let's get in if it takes out the prior close, and that's your entry. Nothing wrong with that. You're just giving up a lot. I'm already looking to scale out of a position by the time you're, you're way up there, okay? All right, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. As you can see, the you know, first question you always ask yourself is, what's the net-net price change, okay? And if we take the net-net going into yesterday, we were pretty much flat all the way back to when? June. So two months of sideways trading. And then obviously today puts us back in black net net wise. But look, we're 2.31% away from all time highs. That's one big day. OK. So we want to err on the side of longer term trend. Now, 
you know me, I sure would like to see this market break out. Oops. Break out. Why is it doing that? Break out. There we go. And not look back for a while. Then have some orderly pullbacks along the way. But so far, so good. Let's take a look at the Rusty. And oh, by the way, if you take a look at like your weekly on the NASDAQ, uptrend a little bit more obvious there, right? Okay. And then let's add in a 50-week moving average. And you can see we've had Dave Light. Oops. Dang. Talk amongst yourselves. We've had Dave Light during this entire period. We never did even come down and kiss the moving average. So that's been a pretty good run. Russell 2000, pretty much sideways. Well, it doesn't look that sideways. It looks like a long-term uptrend so far. But when we go to a daily chart, you can see pretty much sideways, actually still below its 50-day moving average. But let's err on the side of the longer-term trend. We're also a little bit more volatile in general than the other indices. Let's take a look at that. We're 2.28%. That's a day or two away from all-time highs, a one really good afternoon. Not a tremendous amount to report in the sectors. The action is a little mixed. Energy's tried to rally, but then they came back in. What's the net net here? Mostly sideways for one, two, two and a half months. So I don't see any reason to rush out and buy a bunch of energies. If you like something, fine. I really like it, I should say. But as a general statement, I wouldn't rush out and buy energies. You can see metals and mining are kind of melting down a little bit this morning. No pun intended. Where's the trend? Well, it's mostly sideways. Okay, what's her name? Claris Peller. Where's the trend? You know, this is, uh, I'll get charts like this all the time. Hey, Dave, I'm thinking about buying. Why? Where's the trend? But you can see gap down this morning so far didn't ogre back up. So that looks a little ugly. I'm not going to rush out and short them, but I'm certainly not going to rush out and buy anything there. To my surprise, real estate actually made new highs just yesterday. That is spite of bonds. Remember, real estate is an interest sensitive market, obviously. But in spite of bonds being in general in a bit of a slide, bonds down, rates up. Okay. Speaking of bonds, as long as bonds hold these multi year lows in here 15, 16, 17, 18 lows, I'm not going to get too excited about bonds. What's a dollar doing? Dollar's kind of Flatsville. Actually, kind of rallying a little bit in here. I am long the pound, so I'm not happy with that. Retail banged out some new highs, and now it came back in. So this is a bit of a bummer. But it's having a pretty good day today, and it's not that far away from all-time highs. So let's do what? Let's give the benefit of the doubt. And if we measure on a closing basis, it's only what? Percent and change away. Computer hardware, in other words, Apple, coming back strongly today. What's Apple doing? Apple banging out new highs with vigor. So not all is bad in the world. Just because Facebook and Twitter are getting whacked a little bit, some stocks are actually doing pretty good. Health services, not too far away from all-time highs, longer-term uptrend intact. So as you dig, you could find a little bit of everything in the sector. So it is a little mixed. And you can see semiconductors just stuck in the sideways range. That's why I hadn't been too excited about semis as of late. And as a general statement, I do like to see the semis go in the same direction as the overall market. That's pretty much it in the sectors. I think the bottom line is it's just kind of mixed out there. So I would be selective in waiting for positions. But here's the deal. Especially if you're looking at like the NASDAQ or even more so the rusty since it's just kind of chopping sideways this is why we haven't seen a whole lot of setups as of late and there's nothing wrong with that sometimes you just sit on your hands and that's a lesson that was really hard for me to learn all right let's open it up for individual stock picks and then uh 
we'll get to those. Or any other questions that you may have, anything we've covered so far. Got a quiet bunch today. All right, any individual stock picks? Nothing, huh? I'll give it one more second. All right, going once. Going twice. Is this thing on? <laughs> All right. Well, once again, I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Kind of short and sweet today. Uh, if we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And I'll see all you guys and girls again, hopefully, next Thursday. Thank you so much.